being radically vulnerable with people, I think, is such a big superpower because most people try and hide their flaws and their imperfections and their hardships and show Instagram and the world that I'm a perfect person I've never lost. But being like radically aggressively vulnerable with people, they're like, oh my God, you know, we're so similar. And then you build that deep and strengthened connection with each other because they realize that you're human too. Before I ultimately dive into all of these cool and amazing things that you do to uncover who you are, what you do, how you do it, and how you go about it, I want to start by asking, who is Justice Mendez? Yeah, so uh, I'm originally from the west side of Cleveland, born and raised, um, you know, raised by a single mom. Uh, she works in a factory, General Motors, never met my dad. So it was really hard kind of figuring out who I was. But I always try and say that that's uh, my advantage in life is becoming my own man and, and kind of getting to create myself. So uh, I run a venture capital fund. I'm super involved in the community. Um, I help plan conferences here in Cleveland, um, also our own conferences in Florida. Uh, so we invest, I mentor. So a little bit about me, I really like impact and I really like focused on helping others. And to my understanding, you're not only here in the Cleveland area, you're kind of all over the place, but more particularly Florida every once in a while. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I've been living in Florida since 2014 and uh, came back recently to help my mom. Uh, she got stage three sarcoma cancer, so I've been taking care of her, but super happy to be back in the city and uh, make some impact while I'm here. Yeah, well, it's very sorry to hear that your mom's going through that. And I, I think that it's important to understand that relationships are key, whether that be those that you establish from within the family or those that spawn from who you know. And with that being said, if we were to dive a little further into your past and how all of this started, you know, you're already so, you're still so young. So, you know, where would you even go about saying where it started for you. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, my grandparents had a really big role in my life. Okay. And, uh, you know, coming with a single mom, it's hard to take care of three kids. So they kind of instilled that hard work and, and just kind of that dedication. My grandfather came here with 10 cents from Puerto Rico, you know, slept in hay barrels all across the country until he ended up in, uh, in, in uh, Pennsylvania and Erie. And uh, he had an opportunity to work on the railroad. So that's how we ended up here in Cleveland. And um, I would say something that really kind of got that bug in me is in 2008, that's when I kind of really got focused on looking at like the economy and economics yeah. and how finance works. Cause I was like, this just seems like such a foreign world to me. And uh, you know, like still to this day, my mom last year just finally got a debit card. So being in finance, I had to start so far behind and seeing all these finances, you know, fall apart throughout my family, I was like, you know what? I want to take control of my life, and I want to see how this pays a bigger picture into society. So that's kind of where I got that bug of starting to like try and figure stuff out on the financial side of things. Because we had a little bit of a preliminary talk prior to this a couple of days ago, and I was amazed by your ability to utilize the tools that you have available to you to accomplish what it is that you are trying to get done and your business ventures are so vast like i said and not not to not to harp on like an age aspect but i think it's important to understand how impressive it is for you to have accomplished everything that you have within the time that you've been here with the resources that you've had so like what was some of the first aspects or what was the first business that you had ultimately put together yeah first business actually uh first legal business <laughs> was uh selling shoes actually no way so yeah i used to come i was around 15 16 and okay. you know i just started to get into the world of sneakers and i realized that uh these sneakers are super expensive yeah. right 180 dollars retail but one stay specifically jordan's and and when they release it's like kind of like a lottery ticket system yeah so there's only a few pairs in each size so as I started to do is try and get these lottery tickets pay for one go stand in line get the shoes and then sell them for 300 350 plus uh so that's like dead stock you know keep them in the box unworn uh so then from there i also started to find friends who had sneakers you know their their parents 
bought them, you know, sneakers yes. and they wore them a few times playing basketball mm-hmm. or something. And, uh, you know, to them, they don't really care. They just want a hundred bucks. So, you know, they're young. I'm like, Hey, you want a hundred dollars? Yeah. So they're like, yeah, absolutely. And then I go back, sell them for 180, 200. And then that's how I kind of started to, uh, formula, formalize my, my business senses. Uh, and that was on eBay. So oh the first goodness. month, I remember I made like 1200 bucks, and I was just like, okay, this is looking good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What inspired you to start that, though? Uh, not being able to have sneakers. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. So it was like sneakers I always wanted. Mm-hmm. And uh, I remember the pair that I first originally always wanted was uh, the Jordan 13s. Okay. And I was in love with those and uh, just never had the opportunity to get them. So from there, I was like, you know what? I want to get in the sneaker game so I can have some sneakers. <laughs> but but I think also back to part of the, the the question as well is just like, how did I get here with the resources that I have? So I, I'd like to go on like two secret rules of life that I kind of always talk about yeah. is one of them is uh, the law of association, Okay, which is like, you know, a lot of people talk about this year, the average of the five people you spend the most time with. But another part is the law of proximity. Right, because if you really think about it, I want to be around five millionaires. Right, where are you going to find them? They're yeah. probably not in your current network right now. Right. So just putting yourself in proximity around those people who can then influence the law of association. So that's why I went to Florida. That's why you know try and get around these people. You know, somebody once told me, "Why don't you just get a glass of water and go sit at the most expensive bar in town?" And it's like a really good analogy for just like putting yourself in that proximity. And then from there, you kind of build through the law of association by being with those people. That's amazing because that would be where a lot of people wouldn't even know where to start. You know, they'd say, okay, well, that sounds great. Surround myself around people that I want to be like, but where do I go? How do I do that? Where, 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 where is where is step one? Yeah, step I- How did you determine what step one was? (laughs) Well, step one for me was a little different because I was in emergency mode. I just had to get out and, uh, you know, try and find anything and everything. Mm -hmm. But I think for most people, it's just identifying first what you really want, you know, what you want out of life and and where you want to become and then work your way backwards. So I always like to start with the end and then work my way back. So if you're trying to get into finance or you're trying to get into a specific industry identify you know a few of those people that are thought leaders or industry leaders and then try and just give to them i'm always really big on giving and i think that that's you know i I gave this talk in miami it was about you know if you want to get plugged into any ecosystem you got to be the plug yourself so coming in and just being like hey how can i help how can i give to you what can i do and then from there, people will want to gravitate towards you because you're a resource and you're somebody who's adding and not subtracting. So from there is kind of how you start to break in to these you know, networks and, uh, and start to build those resources. When I was watching one of your Instagram posts, and it may have been from that conference itself, but you had talked about leaving your palm down to be the one giving rather than your palm up being the one receiving was that from that conference yeah it was yeah that was a great experience that was crazy oh. most people i ever spoke in front of before it was like 300 that was eight thousand. Oh my! Goodness. and yeah and i wasn't nervous up until about 20 minutes before the talk and i'm like wait a second i'm kind of getting nervous is that right is that right <laughs> yeah, yeah and then i just put in some headphones listen to some gangster rap and got ready yes <laughs> <laughs> now, to hone in on some of your personal experiences, is still to stay on that subject of surrounding yourself around people that you wanted to be like, how, how did you do that? And you don't have to like name names, but like, who? How, how'd you get to that point of like actually making that happen? Because it's one thing to say, this is how you can go about it, but it's another to like actually do it. Yeah. Yeah, so I ended up actually meeting these guys randomly uh, in Florida. Uh, Chris Harris, this guy Jamal Gamal Jado, and 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 then their business partners. But um, I went on a random cruise, a, like you know, and I was alone pretty much the whole time, and just happened to run across these guys. And I stayed in touch. That's one thing that I always like to do is no matter who mm-hmm. I meet, I like to get your info, your contact, categorize it in my list by city, what you do, and uh, you know those 
relationships could be lifelong. You never know or who you might bump into down the road. So uh, I met these guys and, you know, a year later, um, and maybe I could touch on this, but one of my best friends is on First 48 involved in, you know, some insane gang violence. And uh, I had to get away. I had to get out. So I reached out to them and I told them, I'll work for you for free if you give me a place to stay. And back to like the giving. So I was like, I'll work for you for free. And knowing them, they're like, free. <laughs> so, you know, they didn't know me at all, basically, at that point. And they're like, who's this random stranger kid? Yeah. I'm like, I'll build websites for you. I'll do marketing. I'll do sales. I'll sell cars in your car lot. I'll clean up anything. And they're like, all right, come on. And I ended up sleeping uh, either on their couch or in the walk-in closet for the first, like, six to eight months. So oh. just back to, like, the giving and just identifying something and being like, hey, I'm all in. I don't need anything in return. You had said, like, you randomly met these people. But it wasn't random you put yourself into an opportunity that you took advantage of yeah no you couldn't have necessarily planned it per <laughs> se but i was speaking to one of our past guests natalie and we were talking about how what's so important is to understand that it takes effort to achieve results. And you don't always know what that effort is that's going to ultimately lead to whatever level of result that you may be hoping to achieve. But at the end of the day, unless you put yourself out there, you are going to achieve nothing. Right. <laughs> and you were willing to give, which allowed you the opportunity to share the value that you brought both for what you were doing at that time, but then what it ultimately developed into that got you to where you wanted to be, doing what you wanted to do. Absolutely. I can't get over how important it is to take advantage of the opportunities that are presented in any which way. Oh, it's huge. Some people always, they sometimes structure can actually hurt you right and having this plan in your mind can also hurt as well so you know this was none of it like you said none of it was planned and sometimes you just have to take random opportunities you know walk through every door you possibly can because that one door is going to lead to two more rooms or two more doors and keep walking through doors and yep. you might not know where it's going to lead you yep. but sometimes you just have to you know and this is where religion plays in they always say you know walk with faith and just really just let things come to you and surrender you know to the to the outcomes and as long as you do that and you're a good person i always believe that you know it'll it'll work out in the most part Taking advantage of opportunities, connecting with people, and the importance of making sure that you not only establish original relationships, but that they actually cultivate into something. So yeah, I would say the first part about really cultivating uh, you know, relationships and people and how important it is, is when I think about you know, what I want to do, I think about strategy, right? You want to be strategic with your time, input, output. I want the least amount of input with the most output. And what that really comes down to when it comes to strategy is the origination of the word strategy means strategos. It's a Greek word, which means uh, commander of war, you know. So it's like kind of this cultivation of, you know, it's basically it's uh, game theory, right? Like I'm playing against you. So when you really think about it, what is your greatest asset as a commander of war? It's your army, which is people, right? So if you really want to build something and be strong and have that force, you're going to have to cultivate and culminate a lot of different folks that are on a unified front and unified goal to where you want to really be. So I always try and, you know, build my army to say by, you know, meeting great people in different industries or have, you know, different cool things they're working on, such as yourself with the podcast. Mm -hmm. So I think it's really important to just kind of build in that network. And that will also be that really big force. Touch more if you can, about the importance of keeping in contact with people. As far as staying in touch with people, because I get this question a lot, they're like, how do you have all these friends that you haven't seen in forever, but you know they're in different cities and you guys pick up where you left off. And I think it's just being genuine, right? And back to giving. So people know that at the end of the day, I have good intentions and I wanna help out. No, I'm not perfect and I make mistakes as well. We all do, mm -hmm. but just being there for people and just checking in, you know, most people only wanna hit you up when they can get something out of you but just checking in hey how you been you know and very rarely do people do that and somebody asked me like where does it come from it's because i genuinely love people 
and it makes it really easy. Like when I look at people, I try to see myself in them, mm -hmm. right? Different aspects. Are they, maybe they're nervous, right? Well, guess what? A part of me is nervous as well, right? Maybe they're anxious. Part of me is anxious as well. They're excited. A lot of me is excited as well. So just like really seeing yourself inside of people helps you kind of form that deeper connection between you guys. That's huge. And it's exactly what Rebecca Maxwell was alluding to in her episode when she said that she takes the time to get to know other people she takes the time to say yes to other opportunities because you never know never what it's going to lead to you never know you never know i was actually just watching something it was a youtube short or youtube video and it was talking about uh just people who are more likely to just randomly talk to a stranger in an elevator are usually more likely to be successful because you never know, right? Yes. Like just spark a random, hey, I like your shoes in the elevator. You never know. This person's like, hey, I like your shoes. What do you do? Oh, hey, I do the same thing. Want an opportunity? So you never know who you're coming across. And you never know who they know. Yeah. Isn't that wild? It's crazy. And is it instances, experiences, and opportunities like those for yourself that has allowed you to, at the very least, take pictures with some of these like super cool people that you've had the opportunity to meet? I mean, how do you even get opportunities like that? <laughs> right, yeah, I mean, right place, right time. Just <laughs> <laughs> we always joke around and, and we tell people, because when, when people find out that our team is just me and one other co-founder, they're like, I thought there was like 12 of you people. Yeah. So, you know, I always say like, there's three of me and there's three of him, you know? So I try and be everywhere and just always going. I don't like to kind of just like sit down and rest and relax. I'm like, let's Let's go. What's the next thing? So do a lot of the opportunities in which you're meeting these people that you're posting like on Instagram, does it have to do with 161? Uh, some of it does. Okay. Some of it just has to be, yeah, I would say a good amount of it's 161 stuff. And okay. Investing, finance, being around the right networks. Yeah. And I would say some of it's just like being right place, right time, and just knowing that things are you know where they're supposed to be. That's huge because I was looking at this statistic the other day and – it was overwhelmingly obvious that the companies that were the most successful were able to attribute their success to timing. Timing's huge, huge. I mean, it's it's crazy because you would think that starting a podcast, you know, six, seven, eight years ago would have been the opportunity to get in early, but it's most popular at this moment in time. So the willingness for people to come onto podcasts, want to share what they do, it's it's easier to probably get someone on to do that now than it right. was seven, eight years ago. They're like, okay, wait, what is this? <laughs> why are you why are you recording our conversation right. and putting it online? <laughs> That's so true. I think uh I I, I think opportunity is gonna be a huge theme of this episode and it's certainly something that you have been able to in some which ways find through you know like diamonds in the rough i mean you have your q parking that you started talk about that yeah so uh yeah so in in gainesville florida it's a college town for university of florida there's every game day during the football season everybody sells their spots and so basically the problem is there's not enough on-street parking. So how do you alleviate that problem is off-street parking in the form of a driveway. So, but I realized that there were certain neighborhoods that still, you know, not even during game season, still don't have enough parking. And there's even a specific block over there that businesses go out because, you know, they're relying on foot traffic because there's absolutely no parking. Mm -hmm. Nobody's going to pay five bucks parking to go get a $5 Chick-fil-A sandwich. They'd rather go somewhere else that has a parking lot. So I thought to myself, and I was like, hey, why don't I just start an app that's like Airbnb for your driveway? And uh, yeah, there's a lot of learning lessons. It was really hard finding developers and yeah. raising some money. And uh, but it was—I mean, I wouldn't have changed it for anything. It was an awesome experience. Um, and back to the opportunity part, I would say that for everybody listening, I think one of the best ways to find opportunities is to help find others, help others find opportunities. Right. So giving opportunities also is a great opportunity within it yourself. Givers gain. Absolutely. I'm, I'm huge on that. It's amazing the doors that will open when you are the one providing opportunities or giving someone a chance. It all comes back 
full circle. It does. It's wild. It's wild. And it's hard to think that you taking that chance on someone is going to pay off. And it, it may not, but the trust the relationship that you establish with that person is going to last 10, 20, 100 times more than if you were to like pay them for you know that service. Right. Absolutely. I literally can't get over how amazing it is to be able to cultivate a community around yourself as well. And it seems like you've been able to do that. And this is where I kind of want to transition into 161. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, yeah. So me and my co-founder, we both had companies at the time. I had Q Parking. He had a a marketing agency that he was doing uh, a lot of marketing for like the city and for UF. And so we met at the Entrepreneurship Club. We were both pitching. It was like a Tuesday night. And, uh, you know, not many people are there trying to pitch businesses on Tuesday night. So that was already a good sign that he's a hard worker. And uh, we both kind of had this, you know, vision around community. So his app that he was pitching was around creating, like, mastermind groups. And I was already doing a weekly mastermind with all my friends that were, like, engineers talking about the bigger vision of technology and just kind of, like, brainstorming. So uh, from there, we actually started to host events together Mm -hmm. around founders, investors, X, Y, Z. And uh, his professor at the time, Martin Schaffel, was, you know, highly accomplished entrepreneur, $500 million exit, 100% equity owner. And, you know, he kind of took us under his wing and was like, hey, this is what I do in Tampa. You know, you guys are trying to get together with young entrepreneurs. This is like the next level. And he started, everybody was like nine figures plus in the room and highly accomplished entrepreneurs yeah. in Tampa. We went to a 25,000 square foot house and we were like, okay, we're mind blown. We got to take this elevated experience and bring it back to Gainesville. So we started to build like curated lists of, oh, wow. of people that we want in the room. And I think that a lot of people kind of start the opposite way of just being like, here's a networking event. Whoever registers and shows up, they show up. But the big bosses, they don't want to be pitched by, you know, 20 times by some guy they're not trying to connect with. So we started with the people we wanted in the room that would create this really high collective experience. Mm -hmm. And uh, it got really popular. So the events were like some of the most popular in North Central Florida around investors, companies, uh, you know, professors would show up. But, you know, it was cool. We were having an impact. But, you know, I told everybody else in the group, especially Pablo, I'm like, we what are we doing? Right. It's cool that we're doing this, but like, what's the bigger picture? Mm-hmm. So we all sat down and wrote down our, our long term vision. And a few of us were watching Y Combinator, which is incubated Airbnb, Coinbase. I mean, uh, countless companies it's like over three or four hundred billion dollars worth of companies so we're like why don't we start something similar to that an accelerator so that was like a long-term vision and uh the pandemic happened going into 2020 and we were just doing events and we're like well what's next so we went straight into our long-term vision and launched a virtual accelerator to help founders because i really believe you'll figure out who the real leaders are when the tough times hit and when the pandemic happened, a lot of people kind of shut down. They didn't know what to say because they didn't want to offend other people. They didn't know what to do because they didn't want to offend people or get people in groups. And, and people just didn't know how to navigate this. So a lot of people just kind of backed off. So we were like, if we're real leaders, now is the time we have to step up and help people. So we started a completely free program, 10 weeks. Mm-hmm. It's a 10-week accelerator, completely free, teaching people how to launch product, how to you know build revenue. And then at the end of the 10 weeks, we get a bunch of investors that might want to invest in their company and that's our demo day so it went really great we had 40 companies helped them raise you know millions of dollars and then you know me and pablo looked at each other and we're like we're doing all this for free you know now it's you know now we have to really start to figure out what you know because we can't do this for free forever that's realistic so we uh you know one of our mentors was just like you know you got to sit you got to have a seat at the table so we're like you know what we asked everybody, can we get some some carry off the deals? Can we get a cut? 
And most people said no. So we were oh. like, okay, well, if we can't get, you know, a little bit from the introduction, we'll just manage our own money. Mm -hmm. So that's when we started to raise a fund and put everything together. So, yeah. And sorry to drag that out so long, but that's the, uh, that's the story behind it all. God, no, I, I'm glad that you went into that much detail because it opened opens the door for like additional questions that I have. Now, how does someone ultimately just say, okay, this is what I want to do. I want to, I want to start doing what it is that you did. And then you said like, wh wh how did you even know where to start? Yeah. So I think we just started around solving problems. Okay. Right. So we, we saw that a lot of our friends were launching great companies and leaving, you know, to New York or mm -hmm. San Francisco. And there was a really big problem on early stage capital. Uh, and it's the same here in Cleveland as well. Just like you're an early stage company. Where am I going to find investment? And in, Sil in Silicon Valley, you could have a napkin idea and mm -hmm. get a million dollars. And so we we're like, you know what? Let's, let's try and solve the problem of these founders needing access to capital and access to resources and mentorship. So I think that that was like a really big portion of it is just kind of solving a problem. And then also kind of back to the 2008 thing, I think I really saw that a lot of these people who were making the decisions in the world, they were in finance and they own companies and corporations. And uh, I mean, the president, right, is mm -hmm. backed by somebody. You mm -hmm. want to be a mayor, you have to go raise money. And it's usually mm -hmm. from corporations and, and high net worth individuals. So I realized that that's the actual voice, you know, behind what's going on is uh, the people that have the money and the people that have the power. Mm -hmm. So I was like, okay, well, if I want to make an impact, it's going to be really hard for me to solve the world's problems when I have neither of those things or mm -hmm. you know, none of the above. So I was like, okay, if I want to make an impact, I need to be creating jobs. I need to be mentoring people to start companies. I need to have you know, this sense of influence behind me. So that's when I started to kind of put the pieces of the puzzle together. And I'm still putting them together, but mm -hmm. each day the vision gets a little bit more clear. Yeah. So you find out the purpose for what it is. You understand that you are solving problems and that you are bringing opportunities to people. But it like it still, it's like now that you have that idea, how how do you put it into fruition? <laughs> that's a that's a great question. Uh, so so kind of back to the part about like identifying people. So when we wanted to launch the fund before we even started, we identified sixty five plus other investors who were doing it at the level that we wanted to do it at, mm -hmm. and uh, we just interviewed all of them one by one. And we we're just like, hey, you know, I have questions. How do I get started? What do you think is your, you know, best advice for us, but also advice that you took from other mentors? And after like 65 different interviews, I think a lot of the bigger picture stuff just started to come together. So for anybody listening, it's it's the same thing. Identify those who are doing what you want at a certain level that you want to do it at and just most people will be willing to give you the time and tell you, hey, this is what got me started. These are some of my learning lessons. And that's why I think finding a mentor is so important because they can save you the time of making those mistakes that you would make, you know, without having that mentorship. I'm glad like that's where you took that question because that's exactly what I was looking for. People seem to not think that they can do it because they don't know how to do it. But there are people that know how to do it. Find those people who are in those positions. Exactly. Take what it is that they tell you is important, and then you can determine, okay, well, does that fit for me? Is that what I'm looking to implement into my process? Or am I looking for something different? Absolutely. One of my favorite quotes is actually Sir Isaac Newton. It says, if I see further than my peers, it's by standing on the shoulders of giants. And what that really means is like, you don't have to recreate the wheel, right? Like somebody already did it. How can you do it better? So that's what he means about standing on the shoulders of giants. Somebody's already been there, but how can you stand on what they already did and elevate it even just a little bit more? Mm -hmm. And that kind of gives you like that new perspective of, of somebody who's been there, done that. And it, it really does save a lot of time and helps you kind of figure out where you want to go and what to do. I want to take a step back and I want to acknowledge in, in so much ways kind of like what just happened because it's been something that I've been thinking more and more about. You brought a past experience in which you had either read, heard, saw, or watched that Sir Isaac Newton quote come in front of you. And it has made enough of an impact on your life to be able to recite it here today. 
So my question to you is like, do you do you read? Do you research? Do you watch? Like, it seems as though the more and more I listen to podcasts or watch podcasts or you know just like learn about people, they attribute a lot of their success or their knowledge to knowledge that was gained or learned. And part of me is like, well, I guess I haven't determined where it is best to pull from in the same which ways that it seems like other people have actually figured out. Do you have somewhere that you go for all of these things that are obviously like in so much ways motivate you, keep you going, and then give you a point of understanding to move forward with? Yeah, so uh, two more qu- corny quotes is they always say like readers are leaders, earners are, are learners, right? And I'm just naturally curious. Mm-hmm. So I think that a lot of highly successful people are also naturally curious. And sometimes there are different parts of information that sometimes you can kind of connect the dots. Um, but I just try and learn about everything and anything. So I'm like naturally curious. It's why I read a lot. I, when I'm like bored or have some downtime, I'll like listen to other podcasts or I'll listen to audio books or I'll just listen to like people who I think are highly successful and hear, you know, their stories. So I just like seek out random bits of knowledge that I think would be helpful. And, uh, you know, I'm trying to identify a few areas of life. So like investing, health, um, mindset, like meditation kind of stuff like that. Um, so yeah, there's a bunch of different resources, but you know, I always like to say that now with YouTube and everything online, like there's no excuse, you know, like you can go out there and get the information and most people just say, well, I was never taught. Well, nobody was taught, right? You have to go seek the knowledge. And there's another really great quote. It says, uh, you know, the, the, the tongue of wisdom right and and the words of wisdom are closed uh to the closed ears right so like you have to have it they're only open to the ears of understanding so like you want to be like hey i'm curious i want to understand and that's when the wisdom will come into your life is when you're ready to listen i i appreciate that i don't know i'm kind of having like a moment right now because i think like that that's so cool and it, it relates to a little bit about what i am selfishly doing here it's like you have the opportunity to read you have the opportunity to um watch but like in some which ways through having a conversation and gaining the knowledge from those like yourself that i'm speaking to like this is kind of like me being like this is why I'm six months in and still doing this. This is why it's so easy for me to want to continue to do this. And um, I appreciate you giving that to me. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And now I can see why you're on stage and why you're giving these speeches and talking in front of so many people because you're able to articulate thoughts feelings and ideas in a way that people are really able to connect with them. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. One thing I always try and say is like, I think a lot of people, a lot of the world's problems come from miscommunication. So one of the things I really wanted to set out is, hey, if I want to have a a positive influence on others, what do I need to do? And I need to be a great communicator. And a lot of people just go into multiple topics and thoughts at once. And it's really important to be concise and, and very like short and simple. You know, I try to give a lot of analogies and I like to make it as simple to understand as possible. I think that you're a good storyteller and Thank people you. relate to stories. Yes, absolutely. And if you don't have a story, now's a good time to start working <laughs> on it. <laughs> right. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. <sighs> Everybody has a story and they just sometimes they forget that. And, uh, you know, one of my best friends who I was talking about who's in prison right now, you know, he always says, you know, your pain is your platform Mm -hmm. and, you know, and your purpose aligns with all of that. So just being true to yourself and and being radically vulnerable with people, I think, is such a big superpower because most people try and hide their flaws and their imperfections and their hardships and show Instagram and the world that I'm a perfect person. I've never lost. But being like radically aggressively vulnerable with people people they're like oh my god you know we're so similar and then you build that deep 
and strengthened connection with each other because they realize that you're human too mm -hmm. and we're all human and we all make mistakes and we all have our own problems and issues and you being vulnerable and just real with people like you could just connect at a way deeper level than if you just you know present yourself as some perfect person vulnerability and authenticity go such a far way such a far way and it can be something as silly like for me it, it's been hard to like wake up and get out of bed in the morning yeah and there i needed a little bit more in some which ways a motivation and accountability than just me thinking that i need to do it on my own so a part of what i've been doing is um, posting a like 6 a.m. accountability post. You see that? I see it. And that has, it sounds silly, but like, yeah, it's I huge. post it and I, or I, I'm like laying in bed and it's like 602 and I'm like, you know, I, I, I can't, I can't let my followers down. You're like, I can't let my people down. Right. Yeah. It's so true. I mean, they said like, it's, I forgot the exact statistic, but people who share their goals with others are statistically more probable to actually achieve those goals because of that exact reason. I told everybody I was going to quit smoking cigarettes. So now if they see me smoking <laughs> a cigarette, you know, I'm a liar. So like people, when they tell their peers certain things, it's, it's, it's huge. It's important. So keep doing that. I think that that's like a part of, you know, part of the process. Yeah. And these little drop-ins from people say, they'll message me. They'll be like, You inspired oh, me. You inspired me. You inspired me. Or I look forward to seeing that in yeah. the morning because it gets me going. Or I'll, I'll get myself in check when people be like, hey, I didn't see. It's it's I, Thursday. I didn't yeah, see one. Right, right. I didn't 6 see one. <laughs> <laughs> it's 11. You're just getting out of right, bed. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> I, I think finding those small things that you can do and, and switch it up every once in a while too if, if you need something new. But I think finding those small things ultimately keep you going, keep you on a routine. But to your point, not so much of routine in which you become regimented and stagnant right. with where you are. Because growth comes from doing things that are uncomfortable. And the more that you do things, the more comfortable you get with them. Bingo. I love that. I mean, that's huge. I mean, they were just saying like, people, they're comfortable. People ask me all the time, how do you publicly speak? And I'm like, I, I mean, usually I'm a pretty extroverted person, but it comes with repetitions. Yeah. And after you do, people are confident doing things that they're good at. Mm -hmm. And how do you get good at something? practicing and having repetitions. So the more you do something that you're bad at, you'll get good at it. And once you're good at it, you'll like to do it because you're good at it. So just like starting out somewhere and just getting those reps in. Getting the reps in. And then, you know, hopefully that thing that you enjoy is able to ultimately bring you fulfillment. Absolutely. In whatever way that may be. But more times than not, you are going to be at the very least recognized for that. Um, and there are different ways that people can start, you know, for example, with public speaking, you know, literally putting a camera in front of you and you practicing what it is that you're going to say, even if you're practicing a speech that you're never going <laughs> to give, you can literally just do that. And then all of a sudden you watch it back and then you're like, okay, this good. either I'm pretty good or oh God, like that really wasn't all that good. But now you know how to improve. Now you know what people are seeing. Now you know how to put yourself into a position the next time you film it to think, okay, I'm not gonna fidget or I'm not going to stutter or I'm going to work my best to figure out what I'm gonna say in the times of improv with a shorter amount of time than needing to you know, do something that would ultimately just lead you to it being awkward. Yeah. You know? yeah. <laughs> Have you done improv before? No. Okay. No. I was um, curious. I do a little bit of, because I'm in this networking group and then I'm in the Rotary Club and every once in a while, like MC an event. And I like to have a structure, but I would say the most improv that I do is like adding little things between the main points that need to be said that ease the tension. Yeah. in the room and make things a bit more like like kind of casual yeah light you know light yeah because i mean yes you want to remain professional but you don't want it to 
be, you know, like super, you know, like stuffy right. and no one wants that. That's Nobody. not fun. That's not fun. That's why I like the direction that it seems like a lot of businesses are going. It's, you know, you don't want to be too casual, but at the same time, it's like, hey, listen, we all wake up in our pajamas. You know, we all yeah. have a morning routine. We all get into work and then we all go home and we change into comfy clothes, you know, and then we go to bed. You know, like it, we're, we're, we're bringing back the um, humanity aspect of who we are. And we are people who are fulfilling roles within society that hopefully bring to the betterment of everyone's lives. Absolutely. Yeah, I agree. I mean, you see all these businesses now on, on Twitter having Twitter beef, you know, yeah. it's like that would never be 20, 30 years ago. They have yeah. to have that corporate face. Yes. But now they're like, your ice cream machine is down. And they're like, your nuggets suck. And yes. <laughs> yes. It's funny. Yeah. I've been looking at businesses as of late and, you know, you scroll down to their bottom page and they usually have social media. And I see a bunch with like Twitter pages. Now, I click on those Twitter pages and they haven't been updated since like 2015 or 2017. <laughs> But do you know, like, was there a big push to, like, get companies on Twitter? I've never been a big Twitter user. Me neither. Yeah? Yeah, I'm, I'm not big on Twitter. Honestly, I barely ever use it. And some of my friends have raised, like, millions of dollars off Twitter. Or, like, yeah. they find great investments through Twitter or they're, you know. I think just uh, a lot of businesses are trying to, like, find different channels. Yeah. And I think social media is a great, like, cheap channel to get a lot of eyeballs. Like, if you have something that goes viral, literally cost you no marketing dollars if you do something cool. Mm -hmm. So I think just businesses were seeing that as, like, a really, like, cheap and effective way to scale your marketing efforts. What do you think on the virality of products and services for business? Do you think it actually translates to dollars? Or do you think that it's more so just this, oh, good for you? Whatever. <laughs> I know with Popeyes, they made like hundreds of millions of dollars <laughs> off, the, off that chicken sandwich. True. Yeah. So I definitely know that the virality stuff like could make you super rich and yeah. have drive a lot of sales. Uh, I think it's also you have to be intentional mm -hmm. about what you're doing. I think, you know, just having something go viral won't be enough. It has to like have a call to action or push somebody to have a certain behavior. Um, I think some people are just making videos just to make videos. And if you do something that like has intention and purpose, just like your podcast, mm -hmm. I think that's when a lot more people can like resonate and kind of create that connection between themselves and your product or your platform. That's so true. It's so true. And like you said, it gives people the opportunity to become a community that right. they can rally behind. Uh, Mike Caparanis, who was one of our first few episodes, owns a marketing company here in Cleveland. And he says the best thing that you can do for your business to get people to rally behind is to have a message, have a value that is being offered through the service that you're providing, but it being more than that. Absolutely. Because if you're only providing a service that doesn't lead to anything aside from that service being done, it's like, okay, good. Thank you. But that doesn't lead to a referral. That doesn't lead to you being talked about. Unless you have a strong message that people can get behind, you're not going to go as far. I totally agree. Yeah, I think now more than ever, people are trying to seek connections, right? Seek connections. You know, we're all on our phones, so you don't get that as much interpersonal connection. So I think people want to feel connected to the brands that they buy. Yeah. They want to feel connected to the owners from which they're spending cash with. And I think the best companies in the future that are coming up are, are really community driven. And that's externally within people that, you know, build a community around their product, but also even internally within their team, right? There's like a community of people within their team where you know like the google lights right like they all have like a nickname where they're like oh you work for google too amazing right and then there's like products where people are like oh my god you have that fried chicken sandwich too you know mm -hmm. so like now we have like that connection like you also have it so yeah i think that those it's super important for every business going forward and any brand yeah well i mean you think about those like emma chamberlain or Who's that one other girl who's really big? Alex Earl, 
Have you heard of her before? I don't think so, no. I, I only know her because I've heard of people talk about her, but what these people do is they ultimately bring together a group of people that they have attracted through their authenticity and their vulnerability and their ability to be comfortable with oversharing right. to the point of getting people to relate to them. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's really important to be like authentic and vulnerable. Back to that vulnerable piece is that people are going to be attracted to you no matter if you're great, bad, good, ugly, whatever, right? So like people that are putting out a really bad, hurtful message, people are still going to attract to that. Yes. And and there's some people out there that love that. So it's like people are going to still attract to you either way. Why not just be authentic in who you are? Because also people are going to be unattracted to you no matter what, right? It's like that, I think, Maya Angelou quote where it says, you could be the juiciest, ripest, ripest peach ever, but people still don't like peaches, right? So like you could try and button yourself up whatever way to try and appeal to people. But if you're just authentic with yourself, you're going to you're gonna appeal to people who believe in what you believe. And you're really going to attract the right people instead of just trying to put on this persona for others. Exactly. Don't And don't get discouraged by people not being attracted to you based off that point that you just made. Right. You may have something that is great to offer, whether that be a product, whether that be in a service, whether that be just a relationship that you have with that person it can be right it can be the best thing for them they just may not know it right absolutely reminds me of like this tiktok video i saw the other day about this one guy being like when you know the services that you like it doesn't even need to be services but when you know what you bring to the table and someone does not understand the value that doesn't mean that it doesn't have value. It's just that they don't know what that value is. Absolutely. And the guy had like uh, literally pieces of gold and was handing them out at the street. You know, sir, would you like two ounces of gold? You know, they're like, no, no, no. Yeah, everyone's saying no. that. Was that that Trax NYC guy? It, 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 does Maybe. he do something with like watches and jewelry? Yeah. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. And I'm like, dude, that's so, that's so right. Like he should, he, he knows the value of right. what he is trying to give people. But there are people that are going to say no. Why? Because they don't want to be bothered because it's not what's important to them at the moment. Not enough people take that time to say, okay, let me hear you out. Right. Absolutely. And I think that if you know your value, right, you never compromise. Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, he doesn't need to feel like, wow, I'm, I'm stupid or I'm worthless. I'm holding something that's invaluable. He knows that that gold is worth value. So he's like, okay, you don't want it. You're not the smartest guy in the world, right? <laughs> he's like, I know what this is worth. So it's the same thing with us internally. It's like if you know that you're valuable and what it's worth, you're not going to start to compromise and feel bad about yourself when people aren't you know, liking what you're offering. And if we take a moment, though, to acknowledge the fact that it's it's hard that that is hard like it's so hard. we we can say it it's so and hard. we can have something so great but if it is rejected that's hard it's hard it's tough yep it's hard it's really hard um and, and sometimes it's just like maybe what you're offering is great but maybe you're offering it to the wrong people yeah Right, so then just trying to mix it up and get in front of other people, I think, is super important because just because one person doesn't like it doesn't mean everybody doesn't like it. So I think just figuring out and identifying who does like it and who's in the market for this right now. I'm glad that we took the time to be able to say exactly that because even those who look back who have struggled with something like a eating disorder or they've had self-doubt their self-confidence isn't high their self-esteem is low when you find someone who has dealt with that and they grow into a person that then they are more proud of because they are more confident their high their self-esteem is higher they look back at that time and they will acknowledge how difficult that was and how much time it took for them to pull themselves 
out of that situation. Absolutely. And, uh, I mean, small wins always helps. But, I mean, that was myself when I was here in Cleveland. Like, yeah. anybody who knows me forever known like, everything that I'm saying today, I've been preaching my whole entire life. And before it was it would fall on deaf ears, right? They're like, you're crazy. You know, I don't want to hear that. Okay, blah, blah, blah. I want to go do this. I want to go have fun. I want to. So, like, sometimes you know, everybody's going to think you're crazy. Everybody's going to think you're weird, right? You just have to stay true to yourself yeah. no matter what. And eventually you'll realize when you get around other people, they value what you're saying. You're like, wow, okay, maybe I was just around the wrong people. <laughs> yeah. I'm really glad we had the opportunity to peel back the curtain as to who Justice Mendez is because whether they look at any bit of your social media to see how fun your events are or how cool your photos are. I think a conversation like this really opens the doors for people to see how great of a person you are, how motivated you have become, and how this is not the end for you. And it's hardly the beginning. You know, you are going to do so much and you're going to achieve results. You're going to achieve every bit of what you want. And I'm certain of that just because even from the short conversation, I, I know that that's what you will do. That's what you will make yourself do. <laughs> um, but with that, I wanted to ask, because you've had the biggest smile on your face the whole time. So I guess you could say everything that we've talked about for the last 50 minutes. But with that being said, I wanted to ask, what makes Justice smile? Yeah. So for me, just putting a smile on somebody else's face. So I think that that's how life is, right? You get what you give in life. And that's, you know, a philosophy that I try and live my life by. So, you know, putting a frown on somebody's face will never make you smile. Putting a smile on somebody's face every time is going to make you smile. So, you know, the more that you give out, it's one of those things that you can never give it all, right? And it's not worth anything until you give it away. So it's like there's this really great poem about a smile. But, you know, just making other people laugh and feel good is like, number one for me not everyone will remember what you've said to them but they will all remember how you made them feel absolutely yeah can i read that that poem yeah 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 absolutely so it says a smile costs nothing but gives much it enriches those who receive without making poor those who give it takes but a moment the memory of it lasts forever none are so rich or mighty that he can get along without it and none are so poor that he can be made rich by it a smile creates happiness in the home, fosters goodwill, and is the countersign of friendship. It brings west to the weary, cheer to the discouraged, sunshine to the sad, and is nature's best antidote for trouble. Yet it cannot be bought, begged, borrowed, or stolen, for it is something that has no value until it is given away. Some people are too tired to give you a smile, so give them one of yours, as no one needs a smile as much as he who has no more to give. There it is. There it is. Just drop the mic. <laughs> there you go. So if people were looking to continue to keep up with everything that you have going on, where can they follow you? Where can they find you? Yeah. So luckily I use the same name on every platform. It's just my name, Justice Mendez. Uh, that's Instagram, YouTube, LinkedIn, uh, Twitter, but I don't do much on there. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, J-U-S-T-I-S-M-E-N-D-E-Z. Awesome, man. Well, thank you so much for coming on thank today. We appreciate me, all the knowledge yeah. that you dropped on us today. Appreciate it. Thank you for having me.